All right, welcome everyone. I am here with my good friend, A.P. Canavan, also my nemesis, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because very recently I did a reading of a Stephen Erickson poem, an epigraph in uh, the Bone Hunters. It is the epigraph to the prologue and it is called The Age Descending. And in response, AP, Dr. Canavan, did his own reading of the poem, during which a, a few shots were fired, a few fireballs were thrown in my direction. My tweed is a little bit scorched right now, but it is very much intact. So, <laughs> so I am here. So what we are doing today is that AP and I are going to have a little session where we discuss our very our variant readings of the poem. So if you would like to uh, hear me read the poem, you can check out my reading and I'll put a link to that in the description below. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> or if you wanna hear uh, the poem read with a cool Irish accent, you can, yeah, you can check out AP's reading of the poem, which I will also put a link to in the description uh, and, but there's going to be another reading of the poem. Isn't that right, AP? You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, the, as, as if people haven't heard this poem enough, because you and I had those slightly different interpretations of it, I thought, well, technically, Bartes is dead, but Erickson isn't. So um, I, I had a quick chat with Erickson, and we recorded him doing a reading of the poem Oh, and yeah. talking about it and i just i need to uh, do a couple of sort of final edits on the video which takes me a lot of time but um that that will be out on on my channel at some point this week uh where <laughs> ericsson basically goes through what he was trying to do with the poem so oh. you'll, you'll have three different uh readings three different uh ways of it being read and three different interpretations of the poem to look at Ah, oh, that's wonderful. And I would say, you know, after watching Erickson's reading, everyone could see how wildly off we are. But, but that's the wonderful thing about poetry, isn't it? That it does lend itself to various interpretations. Uh, so, and I think valid ones as well. And that's the beauty. I mean, I don't think of poems as, as I said in my video before, they're not riddles to be solved with the correct answer. So I do like that poetry is more suggestive, uh, perhaps. So I don't know if you agree with that, but. Well, and, you know, obviously one of the things that I, I go on and on and on about is when we read, be it poetry or prose, we create the meaning in our minds from the yeah. words on the page. Yeah. We ascribe meaning to it. We, we give it meaning. And that is why so much of what we read, what we experience is subjective. Right. Poetry, because, um, a lot of poems are uh, utilizing imagery, symbolism, metaphor, uh, complex, uh, abstract ideas that they're trying to evoke with a sense of tone. Like all of those things are going to be colored by our perception of them. Right. And when we, we think that a number of poems, even if they have a very rigid meter or a very um, stylized form, Right. They right. do away with a lot of the, the standard punctuation that we're used to, that they play around with syntax, they play around with word order. And because of that, they become more nebulous. They become things that are about uh, literature as art, not literature as I am telling you something. Right. Um, so because of all of those different factors, I think we can have an accepted reading of a poem. We can have a general sense of what a poem is, but we can also get these, at times, completely contradictory, mutually exclusive readings of a poem, just depending on the mood we are in when we look at it or the stage of life that we are in when we, we re-examine it, because the sense of meaning we ascribe to things changes. Yeah. And yeah. That, that makes poetry so wonderfully malleable and evocative and brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And one of the points you made in your video, in your reading of, of uh, The Age Descending, 
something I really appreciated, uh, you emphasized the ambiguity due to the lack of punctuation in the poem, which I thought was a great point. And, it, and in my reading, I mentioned the, or actually read from The Wanderer, the old English poem, and you made me think of it again because it's interesting, old English manuscripts do not have punctuation in the poems that are preserved for us in the very few manuscripts that have these old English poems, there's no punctuation and that you don't, it's not written out the way it would be today in old English or in a translation where you have line by line. It's just written, they had to conserve as much space as they could on these vellum manuscripts. So they just would write, you know, until they ran out of space and then next line. So it's up to the modern reader to determine lots of things because there's no punctuation that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. There's been all kinds of ink spilled in scholarly battles over where a certain line should end or whether a certain word should be emphasized or whether, uh, you know, there, are, there also are holes in some of the manuscripts because they were in a fire or they're old or whatever. So there's lots of ambiguity when it comes to old English poetry as well because of the lack of punctuation, because of the age. There are mistakes that the, the um, scribes make as they're transcribing and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, but yeah, Erickson includes no punctuation in the age descending. And, and that is kind of, it uh, does lend itself to, uh, to I think. That's not uh, strictly true. There's, there's an M dash. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we do have an M dash. That's good. Uh, Just one. That, that's helpful. That's very helpful. <laughs> So, but yeah, so I, I liked that point a lot. Um, and in fact, you made a, a, a few interesting points and you talked about it. There, there's a sort of, um, there's an artistic performance involved in a reading of a poem too, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a performative act where you pause, what kind of tone you use, uh, all of these things are factors that influence an interpretation. So, uh, you know, that those are all important factors, uh, definitely. Um, so do we, but, yeah, go ahead. But hang on, but just, just on that point, and, and this is one of the things that um, I had said about um, audiobooks um, and the, the fact that there's a difference and it, it is not one being better than the other. This is about, there, there is a discernible difference and bearing in mind that difference can actually be really quite interesting because an audiobook is read to you by a narrator yeah. and good audiobooks these uh, these narrators are brilliant artists and they interpret the text they give lines um tone they give uh, different characters different voices or they read them in different ways and because of that they act as a way of shaping the narrative that is not present in the written text yeah. so when we listen to an audiobook we are listening to a performance Yes, of the yes. text filtered through the perspective of a narrator just like you can read a play uh, you could read a shakespearean play and go well now i know everything that happened but that play takes on can take on very very different meanings and and feelings when it is performed by people uh, on stage yeah. that is the play whereas the the written thing is the record of the dialogue and the stage directions for the play, the play is the thing itself. So the, I, I had mentioned this in a different video that audiobooks and written texts are, are different because one is filtered through a, a narrator and the other is you are uh, creating it your own mind because you're the narrator, you're the one implying tone onto things. Yeah. And we see that a lot when we listen to poetry or when we read poetry. And different speakers can add completely different rhythms. They can stress different words. They can pause. They, they can do all of these things with the performance of it, which can change that structure, that emphasis. And, and it can actually change the meaning of poems. Yeah. And I think that is a wonderful thing uh, oh, about is. all of this. Yeah, and uh, it's fantastic. So in that sense, the narrator of an audiobook is very much like the ancient bard or the shop, as you would say in Old English. Uh, a lot of people pronounce that scop, uh, but in the dialect of Old English the, that belonged to Wessex, the SC would have been a, a sh sound. 
So uh, what do you mean? It's, it's not pronounced ye oldy shoppy. <laughs> no, good grief. No, <laughs> not. I won't even get into how many things I needed to correct there, but uh... no, but that that I remember at university, um, a very brief internet, we were looking at epics uh, across time. So we were looking at all these different ones and we happened to be talking about um, Beowulf and uh, some of the old English and the Anglo the Anglo Saxon. Yeah. And the lecturer went nuts because he, he just said, if I ever hear ye oldy shoppy one more time. <laughs> I sympathize. I very much uh, sympathize with your poor lecturer there. <laughs> but but it's interesting because I, I loved what you were saying there about the narrators of audiobooks. Because yes, what does uh, shop mean? Actually, it could could mean uh, uh, shaper, one who shapes, one who, as like the word poet means from the the Greek, a creator, somebody who creates. So the poet, the bard, bard is a, is a Celtic word, by the way, so that uh, was imported into English. Uh, these are people who create the story, the moment that the listeners become absorbed in. They create a reality that the listeners become absorbed in. And this is something that Erickson is very much aware of in the age descending, that, that act of creation, that that uh, secondary reality uh, that uh, the, the poet or the bard, because he mentions bards in The Age Descending as creators of a, an idealized past. Uh, so I thought I, th that's just wonderful stuff. Uh, so Actually, that, that ties in, that ties into, uh, you know, Tolkien's whole essay on the idea of sub-creation. Yes. And, what stories can actually do so i mean there are lots of points of connection because i know that you brought up uh, the ubisunt and the wanderer and yeah and uh, that style which obviously heavily influenced tolkien because he was a professor of anglo-saxon yes um so uh, there this is not a new concept the, yeah uh, about uh artists shaping the story and if you think uh even if people don't find that argument persuasive think about when a singer does a cover of a famous song right and they completely change the key or the tempo and that song can take on an entirely different oh, meaning so man. yeah yeah vanna's smells like teen spirit and then tori amos did this very melancholic um cover of it which is much slower and much more plaintive and and much more poignant and it was it was less full of the the angst and the rage and the aggression of the nirvana original yeah and you go that that is what we we talk about when we talk about the uh the troubadours and the bards and yeah. the shops uh at scald uh, telling these stories adding their own spin why someone telling one story they go oh he was the greatest bard of the age and yeah. someone else telling exactly the same story go ah yeah he was rubbish <laughs> exactly well speaking of tolkien i thought it would be fun because some of my viewers mentioned because i did read a, a snippet from the wanderer as an example of an ubi sunt poem in in my reading of the age descending because i wanted to just sort of establish this is what ubi sunt is and this is kind of what the age descending reminded me of um, but I think a, a couple of viewers did mention Tolkien, and there is, of course, a very famous, uh, well-known, I think, uh, poem, probably because the movie also made it famous in a way. But in the books, the poem is recited by Aragorn as he and his companions are on the way to Edoras, um, the, uh, the main uh, hangout place for the Rohirrim. Uh, and the uh, Aragorn originally... Uh, uh, reportedly speaks the poem in its original language, which presumably would have resembled Old English, or it might even been an allusion simply to the wanderer. Uh, but then he translates the poem for Gimli and Legolas. And, uh, and so uh, it, it is a very much in that tradition. And I thought it would be interesting, since viewers mentioned it, for us to sort of take a quick look at it as a, a contrast uh, to what Stephen Erickson does, because I do think that if you look at these two poems, what, what Tolkien does with a, a poem that is very much a tribute, or you could say derivative of The Wanderer, um, 
and, and contrast it what Erickson is doing, I think, in the, the Age Descending, you can learn a little bit about what the authors are all about, I think. So uh, let's just uh, see if I can figure out how to share my screen because I do have the Tolkien poem here. And if I can make this work. All right, here we are. So I'm gonna enlarge this. And here is the age descending. You can see that now, right, AP? Yep, I can see that. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and again, if you wanna read the age descending or, or you can actually see it in uh, The Bone Hunters, it's the first poem in there. Um, but here is the Tolkien poem that Aragorn recites and is included in part in the film, in The Two Towers, I believe, uh, where Theoden is about to go out to battle and he recites pieces of this. But just to give it a quick read, where now the horse and the rider, where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk and the bright hair flowing? Where is the hand on the harp string and the red fire glowing? Where is the spring and the harvest and the tall corn growing? They have passed like rain on the mountain, like a wind in the meadow. The days have gone down in the west, behind the hills into shadow. Who shall gather the smoke of the dead wood burning, or behold the flowing years from the sea returning? So there's Tolkien's Ubisunt, uh, which is a tribute. It's an imitation in some ways, uh, but he's added a bit to it. He has included, so he's got uh, obviously echoes of the alliteration of the Old English verse, but he also has rhyme. He's included rhyme in there. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, in The Age Descending, and in, I think most of his poetry, Erickson eschews rhyme, doesn't he? Yeah. Um... Unless it's Brash Fluster, right? <laughs> Brash Fluster does do a lot of rhyming. <laughs> and, and that it is a point that's made by some of the audience members in Crackpot Trail, that it's not a real poem unless it rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that the, the lack of rhyme is one way in which Erickson's poem feels more modern. And, and that is a tonal difference that also, I think, is related to a thematic difference. So if you look at the age descending, there is an inclusion in, in, in at least the way I read the poem, there's an inclusion of a kind of questioning of the uh, authenticity, let's say, of what the bards say about the heroes of the past. Uh, I think there is a, um, an implicit or maybe even explicit questioning of that. Whereas in Tolkien, I think he takes the Ubisoon theme and what he does is I think very reminiscent of what you would find in Old English. And it's not that, so if you were to read an, an Ubisoon uh, poem from like, uh, or, or snippet from Beowulf, the, the Lay of the Last Survivor, for example, there is some irony in that as well. When looking back on the past, a lost past, the fleetingness of life, all of that stuff. But there's also a sense of futility as the, the last survivor of a certain people buries the treasure of his people. And what good is this treasure going to do anybody, right? This, this, this treasure is no longer useful to anyone. It's buried in the earth. And eventually a dragon comes along and, and claims the treasure. Um, and we know what happens with dragons and treasures and all that. So, uh, but I, I think that there is a, Let's just say that I believe that with the Erickson poem, with um, the age descending, what we have is a more direct questioning of, of, the, of the past, of what uh, our, our conception of the past is. And that's, a, of course, it's a big theme in the Malazan books in general, what he does with historians and, and, and other things. So I thought that was a kind of a nice point of contrast where we have in Tolkien a, 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 something that is closer to the, the, I guess the spirit, uh, and it's very imitative in a way, whereas Erickson does something much more modern. And I mentioned in my reading, I mentioned Yeats before you could, <laughs> because I, I know that Yeats is, is uh, one of your favorite poets. Um, but uh, I, I believe that the, the Yeats is, is a good kind of comparison in the case of the age descending because the age ascending has a more modern feel to it anyway, even though it is to me backward looking in the past and, and what's lost and all of that in some ways, 
Um, what you have in The Second Coming by Yeats or in something like um, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, you have a, an age in which things are really falling apart, where the old narratives are no longer holding things together. And this is the sense I get as well in the age descending. So I don't know what you think about all that, but. The center cannot hold. Exactly, um, yeah. But I, one of the things I think we need to, to bear in mind, obviously like, this is, is fascinating. There is um, not necessarily a, a contradiction, but a competing interests in how we look at the past. And for someone like Yeats, uh, Yeats writing and being involved in the Republican movement in mm. um, Ireland and the, the eventual change from Ireland being under uh, English rule to self-governing. Yeah. That, that is throwing off uh, from one perspective, throwing off the shackles of the past to embrace this new future. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, Yeats obviously was was heavily involved in the creation of a new mythology of for Ireland, the, the, the Celtic twilight. He became uh, more and more engrossed and uh, maybe not obsessed, but certainly intrigued by uh, mysticism and magic and concepts of fairy existing in the real world and this creation of a mythology for Ireland. Yeah. And then we see his manipulation of that in something like Kathleen the Houlihan, where it's deliberately evoking that to create a stirring patriotic zeal yeah. that uh, all of these authors, Tolkien included, I think were very aware of our ability to be nostalgic yeah. about yeah. the past. But that nostalgia is not the past. Right. When we think back, oh, our summers when we were children, it was all sunshine and they stretched on forever. And you go, well, if you go back and look at the historical records for what the weather was like, that's not what it was like when we were kids <laughs> during the summer. That's what we remember. We forget the bad and we elevate the good. Yeah. We have selective memories. And then when that gets retold and retold and retold, that pairing away of the negative to only remember the positive and only remember the positive from one perspective right. is something that gets emphasized. And it's the same about something terrible that, that happens. It's remembered by, from one perspective, that becomes the dominant narrative and everything else is paired away. As, and then that suddenly becomes the truth of what happened. Yeah. And this is clearly a very problematic stance to take, this idea that Yes, I know exactly what happened in the past, because all of that is going to be dependent on where you're viewing that event from. And Tolkien, with his experience of the wars, right? Um, Yeats, with his experience of that political upheaval, mm -hmm. the rise of modernism and the questioning of those things, a cynicism entering into uh, the the literary world right there is a tension then between the cynicism of say modernism versus this more um nostalgic pining right. for the past a simpler time you go yeah. it, and we see this all the time this is a lie that we tell ourselves oh back in the good old days it was a simpler time and you go, it wasn't it was just as bloody complicated as it was now it just was different complications yeah yeah um, and with Tolkien, because of his um, because of his study of Anglo-Saxon, of his study of the the language, of the poetry, of the epics of these worlds, um, you can see his love of that style. But it, I think, it's it's tainted almost, uh, or at least influence if you don't want to use something as negatively associated as taint, but. Um, influenced by his experience of what it was like to be in war yes. that the dashing hero warrior running out um if you take uh achilles versus hector and the two of them having this grand duel between the two of them that's right. not what war is tolkien was very aware of that yeah but there is something admirable 
about looking to the concepts of honor, looking to knowing what is right to do, looking to the past for those things, at the same time being aware that these are narrativized versions of the past. So yeah. that tension between that cynicism that was bred by World War One, World War Two, that cynicism and darkness and gritty reality. Yeah. Versus the uplifting heroism and um, the grand narrative of of patriotism and uh, all of those things that get tied into those concepts of battle. Yeah. Well, speaking of battles, another poem that you actually made me think of during your reading of The Age Descending. I want to share it with you. I haven't told you about it yet, but I'm going to share it here on my screen. And if I can find the right thing here, uh, there we go. Okay, so there's the Tolkien. You can mm -hmm. see this now, right? Mm -hmm. So the other poem I want to share with you, because you really, uh, during your reading, made me think of this, is Grass by Carl Sandburg. So I'll give it a quick read here, and then you can react to why I, I thought of this while I was listening to your interpretation of the age descending. Pile the bodies high at Austerlitz and Waterloo. Shovel them under and let me work. I am the grass, I cover all. And pile them high at Gettysburg and pile them high at Ypres and Verdun. Shovel them under and let me work. Two years, 10 years and passengers ask the conductor, what place is this? Where are we now? I am the grass. Let me work. So can you see why I thought of that when you were doing your reading of uh, The Age Descending? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, if you, if you leave that up on the, on the screen, just sure, while we, sure. we, we, we chat about this. Yeah. Obviously, in The, in the Age Descending, like we, we are talking about the nebulous nature of the past, how right. aspects get forgotten. And here we have the the human cost of these famous or infamous battles depending yeah. on what side you were on but these these battles these wars these situations where hundreds thousands of people died their lives were snuffed out in that instant and yeah. these were world shaping events these were nation shaping events but now over time the grass has gro grown over it that all that is left is a, is a field, that the historical meaning, the impact that these things had are no longer visible. They, they have fallen away. And yeah, passengers ask the conductor, what place is this? Yeah. But at the time of those battles, there was no more important place. And I think that that's what, what I was trying to get at with this. Yes, there are aspects of the past we can look back with nostalgia. The remembering the past, the lessons of the past is something that we say again and again, because those who forget the past are doomed to repeat those mistakes over and over again. Exactly. But there's a difference between being aware of, paying attention to, and venerating it without context, without knowledge and specificity. And what we have here is that time, like in, in Ozymandias, here the grass is that nature does not care. Time moves on. Right, right. All of our great works, all of these terrible acts, all of our great acts, eventually over time will be forgotten. And our lives, and this is the depressing thought. <laughs> this is honestly really depressing. Just a wee bit. Our, our lives ultimately in the grand scheme of things, if you take a large enough time scale, are meaningless. Right. But at the same time, that doesn't change the importance of our lives in the immediate moment. It doesn't change the what we should be striving for, which is to leave behind a legacy of benefit, of good, of right. um, positive impact. Yeah. And one of the things I was brought up with my students uh, when we were talking about, say, the, the sublime, was on a really clear night when you're out in the middle of the countryside and there's no lights around, no light pollution, and you stare up at the night sky yeah. and you see that dusting of the Milky Way, you can experience two completely contradictory emotions. 
yes at yes. exactly the same time and one is the awe and wonder and amazement that we are part of this universe of something yeah. so yeah. vast and so beautiful we are we are made up of exactly the same material as those stars as the yeah. earth that we are all connected to this and that is an amazing beautiful and powerful thing yeah and at yeah. the same time we are so insignificant we are not even a grain <laughs> of sand on the beach that's right and that having those two things that your life in comparison to the universe is absolutely meaningless and at the same time is an intrinsic part of the universe and you go that's what we can do with literature that's what we can do with poetry that's what we can do with these things they hold these two contradictory meanings mutually exclusive meanings and feelings in our heads at the same time yeah exactly speaking of the the uh, existential crisis at the heart of Ubisoon poetry, along with a sense of beauty, and as you say, the sense of the sublime. The last poem that you made me think of in your reading of The Age Ascending, I'd like to share it with you because uh, I think that's a great segue. And again, you haven't seen this yet, but hopefully this will make sense to you. Yeah. I am sharing with you The Splendor Falls on Castle Walls, and this is by Tennyson. It's from The Princess. And I'll give it a quick read. And I think you can, you'll can you be able to see right away how this poem contains both the melancholy and the beauty simultaneously. That experience that you described so aptly of, of looking at the night sky and the stars and that sense of smallness, but that sense of connection to the universe around us. This is something that I believe Tennyson captures beautifully in this poem. And you actually mentioned, I think, even in your interpretation, uh, the idea of a castle and the lives that were conducted in that castle centuries ago and, and feeling the presence, the echoes of those lives. So here we have this, this poem, I think pretty much nails it when, it when it comes to that. So let me read it. The splendor falls on castle walls and snowy summits old in story. The long light shakes across the lakes and the wild cataract leaps in glory. Blow, bugle, blow, set the wild echoes flying. Blow, bugle, answer, echoes dying, dying, dying. Oh, hark, oh, hear, how thin and clear and thinner, clearer, farther going. Oh, sweet and far from cliff and scar, the horns of Elfland faintly blowing. Blow, let us hear the purple glens replying. Blow, bugle, answer, echoes dying, dying, dying. O oh, love, they die in yon rich sky, they faint on hill or field or river. Our echoes roll from soul to so, soul and grow forever and forever. Blow, bugle, blow, set the wild echoes flying and answer echoes, answer, dying, dying, dying. So you see, there it is. Uh, and this, uh, and again, it's the, the beauty of of something that you you can create this beauty and then the echo through time dies away and that's you know clearly um one of the, the aspects that that erickson was playing with yes very much so and i love how in the third stanza so the first two stanzas are about the past and you can almost set this scene right of this uh castle in a valley with a lake and the sun is setting and it's shimmering on the you know the long light shakes across the lake look the alliteration there is just gorgeous you've got internal rhyme in uh the odd lines and in the even lines you've got end rhyme it's just it's packed this poem is packed and it's just very fun and easy to read the uh, the meter is just sort of carries you along um, so it's beautiful. There's a lot of beauty, but there's this refrain as well of these echoes dying. The past, the lives of the past, they're getting fainter and fainter and fainter in the sense of life's fleetingness, ephemeralness. So we're talking about the past um, and it's a very idealized past, obviously. It's a fictional past when you talk about Elfland and all of that. Um, but I love how in the third stanza, the speaker turns to someone in the present someone that the speaker addresses as, oh love, they die in yon rich sky, they being the echoes of the past, 
the echoes that are etched into the very landscape, into the stones of this crumbling castle. They die in yonder sky. They faint on hill or field or river. These are the lives of the past. But then the speaker turns it on themselves and says, our echoes roll from soul to soul and grow forever and forever. Meaning in a few hundred years, we're going to be the echoes. So this sense of connection to the past, reaching from the past to the present, also is a sense of connection to the future. And there's this one vastness that we're all part of. It's beautiful, isn't it? Um, but it's also, it does make you feel a little small. <laughs> but, but also, like, our echoes roll from soul to soul and yes. grow forever and ever. Yes. Your line of descendants, your genetic legacy, that the echo of who you are is born out in your children and your children's children, uh -huh. all down through that line of ancestry. And so there, uh, for some, there is a form of immortality, which is your genetic material will live on as long as the, the human race keeps perpetuating. Well, and I, um, I think in addition, though, <clears throat> you're right, there's that. But I think even if you just consider you don't have children, uh, if you don't have children, you still touch lives and the the impact. Well, not since that court case. I, I, I swear, I haven't been touching any lives. <laughs> well, you'd best behave yourself, young man. Or what is it? The naughty step. <laughs> So, yes, no, I, I, I don't think you have to have children to have this impact no, but, on the future. But yes, I get your point. Yeah. But it was the, that, that's one form of legacy. Yes we, yes. we look then at the works that you do in life, be it creating poetic works or, or artistic works and how they influence right. and shape minds. Look at teachers and lecturers and educators yeah. of all types, how they shape and and uh, leave a legacy in the minds of those that they interact with yeah uh, firefighters and paramedics saving lives and the repercussions and ripples of that oh, even yeah. a yeah. simple act someone is having a bad day and you're polite to them you're nice to them instead of snapping at them yeah and that yeah. that can be such a tiny little moment but that is an echo and a repetition that has an impact on a on that person's life. It might only have a small impact, but if you hadn't been there, that person's day could have been worse. Yeah. So yeah. You, we can't tell these things. We never have the perspective to, to understand the impact that we have on the lives around us, on the world around us, or through time. We, we will never have that perspective. Right, right. And all we can hope is that we leave a, a beneficial, a positive mark in the world yeah and, and don't forget something. youtubers too youtubers <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful uh is there anything i mean i just want to thank you too ap because you really did add to my not just my understanding but my appreciation of the age descending with uh your take on it it was really fun and in spite of the fact that i got scorched a bit uh but uh <laughs> But it was great because I feel uh, a, a real, it, it's really amazing just to, to learn from. And this is something that happens to me in the classroom all the time when I'm, I'm reading poetry with my students. My students inevitably bring uh, experiences that open up the poems to me in new ways, even though I've read them many, many times. So it's just a wonderful thing to be able to share that. Well, um, one of the things I noted was when you, when you were reading it, yeah. You were being heavily influenced by the sort of the Anglo-Saxon rhythms because you and I apply a completely different rhythm to that poem. Yeah. Um, and it's when, when I was hearing you, uh, it reminded me a lot of when I was listening to Anglo-Saxon poetry huh. and when I was listening to those internal rhythms. And it's that that is one of the forms that you're, you know, you have a lot of experience with. So that's why you go with that form. That's not necessarily your default, but it's one that you can fall into. Yeah. And yeah. that, because it shapes how you, you put that rhythm in, that shapes how you're seeing the lines connect mm -hmm. and that's shaping your emphasis, which is why when I did my reading of it, I am I have nowhere near the experience that you have of Anglo-Saxon. But you bring a nice of... Celtic flavor to your reading, <laughs> right? But, and this was, this was one of the things that, I was, I, 
to be perfectly honest, I really disliked teaching poetry analysis when I was teaching at a university. Uh -huh. And part of the reason for this was so much of uh, the, the poetry that was on the, the syllabus that we were teaching had a lot of rhyme. And my accent is so different to that of my students uh -huh. that, you know, when I was reading it and I go, and you can see here that the, the rhyme scheme kind of breaks down and they were all looking at me going, no, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, and, and again, it's, you know, we, we are shaped by our cultures. We're shaped by these sorts of things. So yeah. sometimes like I will miss an internal rhyme because with my accent, it, it, it is pronounced differently. Wow. And that is this this wonderful thing because it, it can lead you down a different path of analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Poet, poetry analysis was never like my big go to thing. I was always a, a, a prose person and we had some fantastic poets and and poetry analysts in the department where I was working. So you're, you're always happy to defer to the expert and then just move on with the things that you know. Well, I would say you're not too shabby at it either. So uh, I certainly enjoyed your reading and I'm really looking forward to what uh, Steven Erickson has to say about the age descending after all this. And interestingly, he applies a completely different rhythm to either of the two of us. Of course. Uh, and clearly he's wrong. Uh, obviously, I mean, he's, he's Canadian, right? It's a Canadian rhythm he's applying there, right? I guess, is that what that is? Yeah, I'm sure it's very polite though. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Philip. And you know what? I, I think I, I, I will retract. You're no longer my nemesis. We're, we're, <laughs> we're just, we'll, we'll just call it a friendly rivalry, will we? You're okay, that sounds nemesis. good, Professor Fireballs. We'll, we'll keep it at that. <laughs> thank you so much, AP. It's always such fun to talk to you. And somehow I always end up learning something too. So uh, this is just fantastic.